All right. Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, and many thanks to Sean Pugh and, uh, oh, Sean Pugh <laughs> and all the organizers of this conference. Uh, in the brief time that I have, I'd like to tell you about a digital archive that I and other scholars, including Professor Salah Hassan and various other scholars, are working to create called Muslims of the Midwest, an oral history project. Uh, this was actually Professor Salah Hassan's idea, uh, so I'll give him the credit for that. Um, this venture involves 10 researchers at multiple universities, uh, namely Michigan State University, Purdue University, Indiana University, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and the University of Illinois at Chicago. At a time when a significant percentage of Americans view Muslims as the foreign other, we intend to show that Muslims have long been part of the American fabric, and that Muslims actually have a rich history right here in the heartland. Indeed, the United States Midwest has been home to Muslims for well over a century. Aside from African American Muslims, Muslim slaves, or former slaves, who may have at some point settled in the Midwest, Muslims have immigrated to the region from the Middle East, Asia, Africa, and Eastern Europe from the, 19th century, from the late 19th century to the present. African-American Muslim movements, such as the Moorish Science Temple of America and the Nation of Islam, developed in the early 20th century, primarily in the Midwestern cities of Chicago and Detroit. Today, Illinois is the state with the largest Muslim population, and Dearborn, Michigan is the city with the largest concentration of Muslims in the U.S. Furthermore, the first purpose-built mosque in the U.S., was erected in Highland Park, Michigan in 1921, and the so-called Mother Mosque of the United States was built in Cedar Rapids, Iowa in the 1930s. Today, Illinois and Michigan are among the states with the highest number or largest number of mosques in the U.S., and Plainfield, Indiana is home to the largest North American Muslim organization, the Islamic Society of North America, or ISNA. To be sure, many important Muslim figures are linked to the Midwest, from Malcolm X, who was raised right here in the greater Lansing area, to Fazlur Rahman Khan, a uh, structural engineer who designed the Sears Tower, now called Willis Tower. Now more than ever, scholars are cognizant of the fact that there is a need for more detailed and elaborate research that looks at the particularities of Muslim cultural history in the Midwest. Especially important in this regard are the various lines of communication that link Muslims across the Midwest. For example, the historic connections among Arab uh, American Muslims uh, along the corridor of Dearborn, Toledo, and Cedar Rapids, or the crucial connection for black Muslim movements linking Chicago and Detroit. Equally important are the global networks for which the Midwest Muslim communities serve as an important node because of the significant institutional presence and commercial activities of Muslims throughout the region. Our project, Muslims of the Midwest, is conceived as a multifaceted oral and visual history project with a substantial research component. The primary goal of the project is to establish and build a digital archive, an archive that documents the varied experiences of American Muslims in the Midwest through testimonies across generational, gender, geographical, socioeconomic, and ethnic differences. Building on the work of other projects, uh, some of you might have heard of uh, Building Islam in Detroit, which was launched by the University of Michigan. Uh, we hope to provide a rich record of the history of a minority religious community that has a long and important institutional presence throughout the region and has served as a central reference point for American Muslims more generally. The earliest generation of Muslims to settle in the Midwest, are, that number is growing smaller every year. And there's an urgent need to record the voices of those remaining elders who are a living record of the past. Also important are the more recent experiences of American-born and immigrant Muslims during the last 35 years with the increased attention on Islam in the U.S. media. This project problematizes, or hopes to problematize, the post-9-11 myopia 
that conditions perception, representation, and self-representation of Muslims. It also offers opportunities to build connections between scholars, students, and communities. So what's the desired outcome? First, we'd like to produce primary source material for scholarly research. I mean, already I've interviewed a few people who uh, knew Malcolm X personally, and some of the information they told me I, I know will be very useful for scholars who study Malcolm X's life. Um, we also, the purpose of this is also to provide material for instructional use for schools and colleges. So, um, what have we done thus far? Our, our team first came together in the summer of 2014 under the auspices of the Humanities Without Walls grant, which you've heard about. We applied for and were fortunate to receive a $45,000 Humanities Without Wall grant. And we are now in the final stages of conducting interviews and hope to edit them and post them on an accessible website in the near future. Uh, thus far, we have in, we've interviewed a wide variety of individuals. For example, Imam Qazwini, a very prominent Shia Imam from Iraq who resides in Dearborn and incidentally was the only Muslim leader that then Senator Barack Obama uh, met with while running for president in 2008. We interviewed various former members of the Nation of Islam who knew Malcolm X and knew him very well actually. Uh, one, sub, one person would refer to him as father. She, she viewed him as her father. Um, I personally interviewed uh, Omar Subani, the uh, founder of the Islamic Center of East Lansing here. Uh, has a very interesting life story. Uh, had reached the number three position in the Depart Ministry of Education in Jordan. Decided to leave it all and come to the United States and start fresh. And he established the mosque here. Uh, and the mosque here in East Lansing actually became a model for other mosques throughout the country. Um, our team has interviewed um, Senegalese Sufis in, de in the Detroit area, uh, various Lebanese and Palestinian immigrants in Dearborn, Toledo, and Cedar Rapids, and various South Asian immigrants in Chicago. Uh, we have uh, one member, team member who interviewed uh, three generations, a, a Turkish grandmother who only spoke Turkish, by the way. We, we're going to have to translate her interview. Uh, her daughter and then her granddaughter. So we have three generations. And by the way, you know, we're not looking at just people who founded mosques. We're looking at all kinds of Muslims. Uh, in this case, we're, we're talking about Muslims who are, you could say, secular Muslims, right, or cultural Muslims. Uh, we're interviewing, uh, we had one person interview various Muslim women working at a Muslim women's organization. Uh, and, and these women actually preferred to do audio only interviews. They didn't want to be, didn't want to appear uh, on film. So, um, so that's a little interesting. Uh, that, that's going to be a little bit different. But we have, so we have a wide variety of interviews. And the end result, the hope is that we'll produce a map, a digital map, uh, bar, not, unlike some other ideas. Uh, and um, the idea is that you would move the cursor over parts of the Midwest, you would see you know, various uh, individuals uh, and their interviews. And then also we would include pictures and, and you know, pictures of old mosques and so on. Uh, so we're still, this is still an early phase, an early stage in the project. Um, and uh, I guess for the sake of time, I'll end there. Thank you.